Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of the Lab 207 webcast. This is Mr. Kite. I'll be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about cell division. Topic for today, for today is going to be Mendel and his laws. And just like always, we're going to start out with our objectives so that you know what you need to know by the end of our little time together. So a couple things. First thing, by the end, understand basic vocabulary related to inheritance. When we're talking about inheritance and genetics, Excuse me, there is a lot of vocabulary that goes along with it, so you should be familiar with some of it. Second thing, describe the four parts of Mendel's model of inheritance. And finally, compare and contrast the laws of segregation and independence assortment. We're also going to throw some stuff about Punnett squares in there. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get going. First thing, let's talk about the man himself, Gregor Mendel. All of you have probably heard about him from basic biology, but just a quick little recap. So there's this guy, Gregor Mendel. He was a monk in Austria in the early to mid 1800s, and somewhere around the year 1855, 57, something like that, he got really interested in peas and how peas pass traits from one generation to the next. So he started breeding pea plants and when he was breeding them, he would breed them for specific traits, whether that was the color of the flowers or the color of the pods, could be the shape of the pods, could be whether the plant was tall or short. He recognized that pea plants had a bunch of variations in them. So he did a lot of breeding experiments and the thing about his method that was excellent was that he kept meticulous records. Everything he did was written down, so he was able to go back and analyze his data later on. Cool thing is, out of those initial pea plant experiments, he was able to come up with most of the rules that govern inheritance a long time before there was any knowledge of what DNA or RNA or chromosomes or any of that was. So he was so far ahead of the game just based on all this information that he had gathered from his breeding experiments with peas. So I just felt like you should know a little bit about him since his work is what we're going to be studying through a lot of this chapter. Now for vocabulary. This is kind of the foundation of a lot of the conversation we are going to have. So a couple words that you need to be aware of. First one is true breeding. Any organism that is known as true breeding reproduces the same trait when bred. So by that I mean that if a plant has got purple flowers and every time it is bred it gives off purple flowers or the kids have purple flowers, that plant is known as a true breeding plant. It always gives purple offspring. When we're doing breeding experiments, there are generation notations that help us keep track of things. So P always stands for the parental generation. These are the parents of whatever we are tracking. F1 is the first generation of kids. F2 is the second generation of kids. And you can go well beyond that, but just recognize it's P generation is the parents, then F1, F2, F3, and so on and so forth. Next term you need to know is hybridization. This just means crossing the genes of two things together. You are a hybrid of your parents. When Mendel was working with his pea plants, he was creating hybrids of those two pea plants. So hybridization just means mixing of genetic material. Alleles. Every trait has got more than one form. So I'm sure you've probably heard of dominant and recessive genes. Gene for, we'll say, eye color. There could be a dominant gene for brown, a recessive gene for blue. Both of those are alleles of the gene for eye color. So know that alleles are different forms of a gene for a single trait. Homozygous, if you are homozygous, this means that you either carry two dominant alleles or two recessive alleles. If you are heterozygous, your genetic makeup for a particular trait has one dominant allele and one recessive allele. Homo in science always means same, hetero always means different. So if something is homozygous, it would be notated as being like big A, big A, or little a, little a. Heterozygous would be one big A, one little a. Phenotype is the appearance of something. So when you look at a dog and you see its fur and its color and all that, you are observing the phenotype of that organism. Genotype is the actual genetic makeup. So realize that the genotype of an organism can be very different from the phenotype, but the phenotype comes out of the genotype. So by that I mean, let's say that, I don't know, we got cats, big B is black fur in a cat, little b, is white fur. If you have got big B, little b, your phenotype is going to be a black cat. Your genotype is going to be one black gene or one black allele and one white allele. 
A test cross is conducted when we need to find out the genotype of an unknown organism. And we'll talk about those more in a minute. But test crosses are used to identify a genotype of an unknown organism without doing any genetic tests. A monohybrid cross is a cross between two organisms and you are tracking one trait. So you might be tracking the color of the peas or the height of the plant or the shape of the pea pods. If you're tracking one trait, it's a monohybrid cross. If you are tracking two traits, it's a dihybrid cross. So in a dihybrid cross, you might be tracking both pea color and pea shape or flower color and plant height. You're tracking two traits through your experiment. All of his work with pea plants, Mendel was able to come up with a model for inheritance that has got four basic parts to it. And these are the four parts. The first part is that there are alternative versions of genes. These are known as alleles. So you might have a gene for one trait such as flower color in peas. For that gene, you can have a purple version, which gives you purple flowers, and a white version, which gives you white flowers. So those two alternative versions of the gene are known as alleles. Second piece of his model was that organisms in inherit one copy of a gene from each parent. So as he was breeding his pea plants, each pea plant that was a hybrid of two parents got, let's say, a purple allele from mom, and a white allele from dad. Same thing with kids. Any gene in your body, you have got one copy of the gene from your mom, one copy of the gene from your dad. And then he decided that if two alleles are different, one is dominant, the other is recessive. So if you get, say, two copies of a purple gene, then your plant's gonna be purple. Or if you get two copies of white, it's gonna be white. But if, say, you get a purple and a white, and purple is dominant to white, then your plant is going to be purple. Final piece is that two alleles segregate, segregate during allele formation. So when the organism is forming gametes, that should say they segregate during gamete formation. So when the organism is forming gametes, sperm or eggs, the alleles separate from each other. So let's say that organism has got one allele for white flowers and one allele for purple flowers. When gametes are made, Half of the gametes will get the alleles for white flowers. Half the gametes will get the alleles for purple flowers. Know that that is Mendel's law of segregation. Now let's talk about Punnett squares and test crosses just real quick. I am sure that you are all familiar with Punnett squares by this point, but I just want to do a quick refresher and talk about test crosses. So Punnett square is this nice little square that helps you to determine inheritance. The things that I want you to recognize about this as I draw a bigger square is that when you set up your Punnett square, it doesn't matter whether the alleles from mom or dad go on the top, but recognize this. Each letter represents one gamete, a sperm or an egg. So let's say dad has a genotype of big A, big A. When he makes sperm, half of those sperm will have that big A, the other half will have that big A. Let's say that mom is big A, little a. When she makes eggs, half of the eggs will have a big A, half the eggs will have a little a. Then these squares represent all of the potential combinations. So you can have big A, big A, 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 A. So out of this, we can see that from this cross, half the kids are gonna be homozygous dominant, half the kids are gonna be heterozygous. Now. If you were a breeder, let's say you breed rabbits, and you want to produce a certain trait in your rabbits. Let's say you want to produce a bunch of offspring that have got a heterozygous genotype. Let's say big A represents black fur, little a represents white fur. If you look at all of your bunnies, you have no idea which individuals are big A big A and which individuals are big A, little a, because this is going to show up as a black phenotype. That is going to show up as a black phenotype. But you know as a breeder that you need to make sure that you mate this one right here. So how are you going to figure out which of your bunnies have that genotype? You do a test cross. The way you do this is test crosses always use a homozygous recessive individual. The reason we do that is the only bunnies you can look at and know their phenotype or know their genotype without a doubt are our rabbits that have little a little a because they are the only white rabbits running around. So you take one individual that is homozygous recessive little a little a 
and you cross it with your mystery rabbit. So in this case, let's say our mystery rabbit is homozygous dominant. All of the rabbits that result from this cross are going to be black. So by doing this cross, our breeder knows that our mystery individual is homozygous dominant. If we were to clear our board and do our test cross again, again we have got our homozygous recessive white rabbit and our mystery rabbit this time is heterozygous. Half of the kids are going to be black, half the kids are going to be white. So we have just determined the genotype of our unknown rabbit. So test crosses used to identify unknown genotype and they always, always, always utilize a homozygous recessive individual. All right, let's talk about independent assortment. We're about to wrap up for the day. So independent assortment is used to describe the behavior of alleles when you are doing a dihybrid cross. Dihybrid crosses, remember, are tracking two traits. So in your cross, you could be tracking, let's say, pea color and the shape of the pea pods. In a dihybrid cross, each pair of alleles segregates independently of the other pair. So what do I mean by that? I mean this. So our chromosomes are like this. And let's say that you have got the genes for pea pod color up on the top, and you have got the genes for pea pod shape at the bottom. Independent assortment says that where the genes for pea pod shape go does not affect where the genes for pea pod color go. They are able to sort out independently from each other. So let's say that you have got an individual that has got a genotype that looks like this. All of his possible gametes could be, he could make sperm that are big Y, big X. He can make sperm, another sperm that is big Y, big X, because this Y could combine with that X, or it could combine with that X. He can make sperm that are little Y, big X, because those two could go together, or another little Y, big X. So when gametes are made, all of these genes, alleles, they can separate out independently. It's not like if this big Y goes one place, that X automatically has to go with it. They are independent characters, and they can sort out on their own. And in most dihybrid crosses, there is a phenotypic ratio of 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. So whatever traits you are watching for, nine of the individuals will have one combination, three will have another combination, three will have another combination, and one would have the rarest of combination. So know that ratio, nine, three, three, one. This has been a tough video to make. I've had a lot of interruptions and stuff, so forgive me for all of the weird edits and whatever that was in here, but thanks for hanging out with us on this edition of the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite. Hopefully, we'll see you again. Thank you.